Well, good morning, brothers and sisters, saints of God. Good morning, church family. Good to see you all here this morning. Wow, you all are a lively bunch today. That's good. That's good, because we got a song this morning for you that if you ain't woke up yet, you will be in about four minutes. Amen. Amen. Is that good to get us started? Yeah, Miss Arlene's ready to go. You got your section ready? You know, make, make sure they clap good as we get going. Let me go ahead and get you to stand with me. If you're visiting with us today, a special welcome goes out to you. We're so glad to see you this morning. Jim, kick it off here right now. You know, I love this verse in the Bible that says, for he that comes to God must first believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him this morning. Let's praise him for who he is this morning. This welcome to First Baptist Church of Friendsville. You're our special and honored guest. So thank you for joining us today. If you are visiting with us and you've got a bulletin, there's a visitor's card on the inside. Hope you'll take just a few minutes to fill that out and drop that in the offering plate as you leave the service today. But man, what an honor to have you join us here in worship today. Pastor Bill is on his way home. Amen. 
Amen. And uh, he supposed to be getting back today. Say what? And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> He's on his way back, and uh, uh, so he hopes to see you all Wednesday, because on Wednesday we're continuing 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the choir room. So he hopes to see you here and uh, continue to pray for them as they travel. It's good to see David Hips made it back from his long journey, so uh, praise the Lord for that. We've got uh, a couple people I know of that that are sick. Uh, Rick Long, he's he, he's been sick. He was at UT, but you know, praise the Lord, he's back home now. So make sure you uh, remember him in your prayers. And Wayne Frank, Wayne is at Park West. Okay, so they've moved him to life care off a of top side, but he's been having some medical problems, so keep Wayne in your prayer if you would. Uh, I don't know, is Larry here, Larry Bradley? Uh, oh, oh, good, good. I'm glad because he's preaching today, all right? <laughs> Amen. So we look forward to hearing uh, uh, Larry give God's word to us today. Amen. I'm going to ask Ken Smith uh, to come up and lead us in a word of prayer. Won't you come on up, Ken? Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day that you've given to us to come to your house to worship together. Lord, we do want to lift uh, both Rick and Wayne up to you. Uh, we turn their healing process over to you. We know that uh, you are the great physician and it's truly you that does heal. Lord, we want to lift up our Camp Lejeune mission trip that is going to be taking place later this month. Pray that you will be with them. We pray that uh, you will be with the uh, workers, uh, be with the children that attend. Lord, we just pray that souls will be saved. Lord, we also pray for the Nicaragua mission trip that is planned. Lord, we know there are some uh, issues with the logistics in that particular mission trip. We just pray that uh, you will uh, touch those things that need to be handled and that everything will be done according uh, to your will. Lord, we pray for uh, this service. We pray for uh, the praise and worship period and for Alan and those that are with the praise team this morning. We just pray that that you will be blessed, you will be praised. And we pray for Larry as he comes to uh, open the bread of life to us. Help us, Lord, to uh, come away with a new understanding. And, Lord, we do always pray that if there's anyone here that does not know you in the free pardon of sin, that uh, perhaps this might be the hour. Forgive us, Lord, wherein we have failed you. These things we pray in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Ken. Everybody to your feet. Hey, let's spend a few minutes and, and let's greet each other in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
that they say if that and don't watch you fire, you ain't got even got any wood. Amen? Whew. Last week we learned a song, and uh, I asked you guys if you liked it to let me know it, and if you didn't, don't tell me. Well, a lot of y'all said you love this song, so we, uh, we're going to do it again this morning for those that need to learn it a little more or didn't get to hear it, so. Greatly blessed and highly favored, imperfect but forgiven child of God. Greatly blessed and highly favored, imperfect but forgiven child of God. Sing it with me now. Greatly blessed and highly favored, imperfect but forgiven child of God. Greatly blessed and highly favored, imperfect but forgiven child of God. Oh, I like this. Standing up right on God's good earth, I'm counting my blessings, great things He's done. I fight the good fight with a blessed assurance that the battle is already won. Greatly blessed and happy favor, imperfect but forgiven child of God. Greatly blessed and happy favor, imperfect but forgiven child of God. Oh, take it up now. Greatly blessed, yeah, and highly favored, imperfect but forgiven child of God. Oh, I'm greatly blessed, and highly favored, imperfect but forgiven child of
clothed in rainbows all living color flashes of lightning rolls of thunder oh bless his name this morning yeah blessing and strong and strength and glory seated if you can um, got a special treat for you this morning I want you to imagine just for a second Scott was talking about Bill being gone and imagine this morning if Bill was gonna sing and give the message <laughs> for those of you that didn't hear at home there was laughter scattered about <laughs> amongst the people we get to have that this morning Brother Larry is going to come. I'll tell you, I didn't know this about uh, Brother Larry till just a few weeks ago. Um, we had a uh, jam session over at the jam at Jim's, and some of you guys were there. And Brother Larry came, and I didn't even know he played. I knew he sang some. He spent 40 years, he says, trying to figure out if he's a preacher who sings or a singer who preaches. So <laughs> this morning, he's going to get to do both. Would you guys make him welcome?
everything was all right between her and him. So she awoke in heaven's courtyard, free from pain within. The angels gathered round her and took her by the hand serenaded by angels up to the throne serenaded by angels finally at home surrounded by praise did see now I close my eyes each night and I try to imagine that city of radiant light waiting for me but my mind So I'll continue to dream Till I am transported there Then I will be Serenaded by angels Up to the throne Serenaded by angels I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never, I've never been before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken. Time won't matter, time won't matter anymore. Beulah land, I'm longing for you. And someday on the I'll stand. Yeah. 
<clears throat> Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. I tell you what, I enjoy, I really enjoy the music here at our church, and uh, not because I, I had the privilege this morning, but I always enjoy listening to Joanne and uh, the, the different groups, and, and I enjoy Alan. He's got such a sweet peer, uh, spirit, and he especially loves music for the glory of our Lord, and, and uh, then we have Colton, and uh, Colton's so gifted. I, I, you know, he's a young man. I don't know if he's looking for a wife. He could not afford a wife because he's got too many guitars, but <laughs> I, would, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I would say maybe if he sold a few pedals and a guitar, or the guitars, he might find himself a, a wife. And, and, and then, of course, uh, Anne uh, has always been a friend for the years, and uh, I've, I've loved them so long. And, and uh, of course, you got first and second Jim up here. They are uh, a blessing to the church as well. And uh, I recently had car, uh, cataract surgery, and uh, I, I think at times I think, well, it looks like it's going to work. And then I start calling you a, a different name, and then you're saying you need to go back and get your other lens, uh, Larry. But I want you to open your Bibles this morning for the time that the Lord has given us. And I want you to go with me to probably a portion of Scripture that if God was to say to me, Larry, I'm calling you home tomorrow. you got one message you want to preach. I would probably want to preach from Luke chapter 15 because I believe that Luke chapter 15 really gives the gospel. Luke chapter 15 talks about lost people. It talks about found people. It talks about a seeking God. It talks about... Uh, rejoicing uh, uh, after the Lord comes into the heart uh, of God's, uh, uh, of, uh, of when the Lord comes into the heart of a sinner that uh, comes to Christ. And I probably would uh, just really plead with the Lord that he would allow this, because in 32 verses we find that the Lord Jesus uses some three illustrations that deal with lost people that deals with a seeking Savior, that deals with a saving Savior this morning. And this morning I would say that these parables, uh, in fact, some commentators allege that this really is a continued story. I don't know so much that. I've never made a decision. But I would say this is that I believe that this parable, and most of us know that a parable is an earthly story that gives a a heavenly analogy or a heavenly application. It usually entails a spiritual uh, lesson or a moral lesson, if you will. And in this case, we find that it's going to talk about a, a lost sheep. It's going to talk about a, a, lost, a lost silver. It's going to talk about a woman that loses a coin. And then it's going to get close to home with most of us in here because it's going to talk about a lost son in the sense where that there was a father's love that availed itself through the whole uh, 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 journey of, of his son when his son went off into sin and he left, uh, he left the security of his home and, and, and he went his way. And you know, folks, the unique thing about this verse of Scripture is really it just kind of complies or it agrees uh, with Luke chapter 19, verse number 10, where the, the Bible says very simply, now listen to me, I want you to understand this part. It says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. You see, I used to, when I first came to Christ back in 1975, that was before many of you were even a thought, but back in 1975, I, I, I got saved so radically from a life of drugs and alcohol. And, and I, 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 my wife just fell in love with Jesus because she saw the, the great change that Jesus gave our marriage and gave our home and gave her husband and, and gave the, uh, the father of our children. But, you know, I want, I want to say this, is that I used to say, I found the Lord. I found the Lord when people would say, now, Larry, how come you don't do this anymore? Why don't you join us anymore down at the honky talks and those kind of place? I'd always say because, you see, I was invited and I, I, I found the Lord. But you, I want to say this to you this morning. We don't do the finding. Jesus is a seeking God. And He is a finding God. Are you with me this morning? And that's why you should love Him even more so. You see, my friend, if you're here today without Christ in your heart, I'm saying to you that He is here and He is seeking. 
He may be seeking on your job. He may be seeking you uh, in your family or in your home life or whatever it may be. But the fact is, is He wants to find you and He wants to save you because He's already seeking you this morning. And so this morning I want to start off with this very question. Have you ever been filled with panic over losing something uh, that was very, very personal to you? I freak out every time. I, I fill my back pocket all the time because I, I have been on so many plane rides as a missionary that, that you see wallets that were left behind or you see passports that were left behind and there's no more gut-wrenching experience than to see that you are without your wallet that you came into that flight with or without the passport. Used to when we would take groups uh, down to China, there was always some teenagers or something that they would, they say they, they're, they're on top of their passport and once we get into immigration and we're getting ready to clear customs, they are filled with panic because they don't have uh, their passport. And to be that far away from home and to know that it's going to really uh, uh, detain your efforts from that point, it's really a very trying thing. You might notice that child. I don't know about you, but when our kids were little, uh, our grandkids, I should say, we got 14, 15 grandkids. I forgot how many we got, but... but you know, when they were little, I, I remember that they were so small that when, when their moms or their grandmother would be with them, they'd be out shopping, they would walk up under a dress rack and you couldn't find them. And you're talking about the heart of a mom that sinks uh, to be lost in a shopping center. And this little girl right here, man, she is telling you what she thinks about her mess up here. And then you might see to the far right what we would call a teleprompter. And that, that is used today for, for people that do public speaking, and in many cases it's used for singing groups. Years ago, I remember singing with Ann and Jim and, and a guy named Richard Goble, and, and when I went up to sing my part, I, I remember that I had this blank sp stare. But I want to tell you a very good secret about good singers like our brother Alan here. When they turn and face each other, you may think it's part of the makeup, but they're really looking at their friend saying, I don't know the next word. Would you help me with that? But Anne began to lip some words to me, and it put me back in the pattern of what we were doing or singing. But my dear friend, I want you to notice that our parables today is going to talk about that of the lost. The lost you're going to find is talking about a lost sheep. That a shepherd would leave some 99, one out of 100, he would, that was really the equation. He would go after that one person. You would find a poor woman that typically would have a headband that was made of some 10 coins that typically would reveal that she was a very poor woman. But she will search high and low to find that one piece of silver so that she can be complete again. And then you will find, uh, we've got kind of a modern day uh, father here, but you will find that there's a son, and in this case there's two sons, where it talks about a, a lost son, where that, that son got off the page and with his father, and, and he went on direction, and he went out to a place they call the far country, whatever that was, and he wasted his inheritance. But you're going to find that God specializes in finding the lost. Why? That they can be found. Because the found in this case you might find is where that, that shepherd was able to go. And, and incidentally, I personally think that, that probably it was a poor, old, poor rural farmer that had these hundred sheep that Jesus talks about. But one of the customs of that day, whether it was a sheep that wandered away or whether it was a sheep that was injured, was to secure that sheep and drape him about the shoulder so that that sheep would no longer uh, hinder that, that wound or in this case would not wander off again. And my friend, I want to say to you, the, the interesting thing about this sheep is that he was off the path uh, uh, simply because it was uh, his choosing or her choosing or whatever it is in this case. <coughs> but you might notice that the ravines and the mountains and all the terrain there offers nothing but, but destruction and offers nothing but really the challenge of danger. And so this morning I want to really 
tell you a, a couple of things, or I want to share a couple of things with you about the fact that, let me read the scripture with you if you just follow along. And I brought these things, whether they're blurry or not. And I want to read to you uh, just really some, some uh, parts of, of this uh, particular text, because they all are talking about the same thing as far as the results but I want you to notice in chapter 15 here, uh, I wanted to call you class. I guess that's okay. You're classy people. But I want you to notice, first of all, the Bible says in verse 1, Then all the tax collector, uh, uh, tax collectors and the sinners. Now, interesting thing that God's Word is saying the IRS and the sinners are the same crowd. I don't know. But anyway, all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Him to hear Him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners. And that word receives is a very interesting word because it means that this man, the Lord Jesus, gives access to all sinners. To all sinners, meaning those that he goes to seek. And the Bible says, So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep? If he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness. Go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. The interesting thing about each of these parables is that it kind of closes with the same synopsis or the same result. Because it says, rejoice with me. It says, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Jump over to the lost coin. Because in verse 9 it says, rejoice with me for I have found the peace. In other words, the silver that goes in the headband of this dear woman. That searched very intensely and that searched <coughs> uh, uh, very uh, dramatically to find that particular uh, uh, coin. And then you, I want you to look at the end of the prodigal son uh, explanation. Look at verse 24. He says, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Jump all the way down to 31 because it says, It was right that we should make merry, mean to be festive about the son coming home. It says, For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. You know, one of the the greatest things that I find in, in worship music and those things is, is trying to bring a group of people into a, a, a really kind of an alignment of heart and spirit to understand that we are wanting, uh, we are wanting to kind of resound to, to the very corridors of heaven in our efforts to sing glory to Him because we are worshiping Him with all our might and with all our spirit and with all our hearts. And the Bible says that any time that something or someone that the Lord is seeking, any time that it is sought and it is found and it is saved, that there's party time that goes on in heaven. In other words, there's rejoicing, my friend. The other week when Pastor Bill was talking about uh, several people that uh, perhaps you're in here today that you came down to the, uh, to the steps here when he kind of waited around for you to talk to you. And uh, I, I remember him sharing with our church that, that uh, you invited Christ into your life. And, and it was obvious to me to listen to our pastor that he's got a great, great uh, uh, passion for lost people. But I could also find that, <coughs> that our, our pastor was so thrilled to know that there are people among our midst that still have, have not really made it right with the Lord. And right here in our own presence, that particular Sunday or, or two or three Sundays before, uh, pastor, was able to, uh, pastor was able to lead them to Christ. So this morning I want to talk about really three things. Number one is the lost sheep. The lost sheep. But this morning I want to tell you that there's three particular joys that I think of this morning. Number one is the joy of finding. The joy of finding. When my wife and I were in our uh, church that we came to Christ, I remember that uh, 
I uh, was so struggling with my lifestyle and and I wanted, to, I wanted to be free of my alcohol and I wanted to be free of those things that bound me and I wanted to give my wife of nine years at that time, we just celebrated 56, by the way, and she still wants me to go for 57, amen. <laughs> and, and, and I wanted my, but I wanted my wife to have something more than what she had. And I remember that on that second stanza of Just As I Am, I don't know if y'all remember that song, but that song is still a powerful song. But I remember my little wife looked at me as if to say, whether you go or not, I'm going. And out into the aisle she went. And on the 44th stanza, I remember that I walked forward. And I remember taking that, that man by the hand and I, wanted, I, I said to him, I heard this story when I was a little boy. But no one has ever explained how it can be personal. And I don't want to just become somebody tied in with a church and then become an orphan. But I want to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friend, I'm going to tell you something. It wasn't emotional that day. I prayed and when I came out, I saw my wife was all wet. Man, she not only got saved... She went into the pool that day, buddy. She was so excited and saying, hey, what do I do now? What do I do now? Well, I tell you what, if you want to get baptized today, Miss Pat, we will, we will show you how to get baptized and then we will disciple you. But my friend, there was great joy that day. I remember going home and as I was going home, I was praying out loud. I'm saying, Lord, I don't have a friend. I don't know who to tell my conversion to. And my phone rang that afternoon. On a Sunday afternoon, I laid across the bed and I cried like a baby. I said, oh God, thank you for the life that you've given me. Thank you that I no longer feel this guilt and this bondage. Thank you that I want to build a marriage the way it should be. Thank you that I've become a father that my children deserve. And I remember that phone ringing and it was my older brother. And he said to me, I just want to tell you, man, I am so filled with excitement about praying for you and Pat and, and to hear the news that y'all came to the Lord Jesus today. And it kind of freed me up because I realized that there was people that understood what I uh, went through. But there's joy in finding the lost sheep in this case. You'll find that really the overwhelming message of the application is that God loves sinners and He will go to any extent to reach a sinner. He'll go to the ravines. He'll go to the villages. He'll go out to places that Rick and I used to labor when we were missionaries. But the Bible says that the lost sheep in this case, that, that Jesus is the very one, the very people the religious world should have been reaching out to were the ones that they shunned. And, and, and Jesus himself uh, basically had the compassion. You know what compassion is? Compassion, I believe, in the life of this shepherd, number one, is, is I believe it means to be moved within. I believe it means to identify. It means to be sympathetic of. But the best uh, definition I ever heard of compassion was the one when I heard of an old preacher that's with the Lord now. He says, you know what compassion is? Compassion is that little moist spot that you just can't dry. Because it comes back time and time again. And his compassion was for the lost sheep. His compassion was for a loved sheep. His compassion was for a lone sheep because if, if, it, if there was only one out there, he would have went after it. And he knew that that one sheep was the one that he needed to go seeking. So we find that there, this shepherd had compassion, but he also had commitment, my friend, and his commitment was, was successful because it did not stop until his mission was able to, to reach and rescue that little sheep and to bring him to a place of, of security and a place of, of safety in this case. He had that of compassion. He had that of commitment. And the great conquest is that he rescued this little animal and he, he uh, allowed this little animal to rest upon his head, his shoulder, I should say. But this morning, folks, do you know what it is when you come to Christ? When I came to Christ, I found such a spirit of rest. I no longer had to hide from God. 
I no longer had to guess, is there a God or is there not a God? I remember the story of two little brothers that were always creating calamity at the church. And the preacher just got kind of fed up with them. And so he, he called their parents and he told them, I want you to come by and I want you to listen to me because I've got to address these little boys. And, and so he thought that he would just be firm with those little boys. And so he brought one little boy in at a time. The other one stayed out in the hallway. The parents are in his office. And he looked at this one little brother and he said to him, where is God? And that little boy looked up like this. And the preacher, with his silence, said once again, a little boy didn't say a thing. He said, I said, where is God? And that little boy didn't say a thing. He says, go get your brother. He went out in the hallway, and as he's coming out in the hallway, he says, the preacher wants to see you. And he said, what is he going to say? He said, well, it seems that God is missing, and they think we had something to do with it. <laughs> but you see, friends, spiritually, that's the way that our family was. We knew a lot about church membership, but we did not know much about the rejoicing and the sharing. And so we go from that uh, of the lost uh, uh, sheep here, we go to that lost coin. Can you imagine a poor woman... How do I know she's poor? Well, they alleged because there was only 10 coins. You might notice the lady down on the bottom left that this woman has many coins because she was known for her wealth. But the little girl up here, she is so excited about that one coin. Man, she's been looking under the bed. She's been looking throughout the house. There were no windows whatsoever. And man, you're talking about home cleaning. She was so exciting when she found that particular coin because she found it once again that she was a complete person. And so I believe that I, I want to just share just a couple of things. She could have shrugged her shoulders and walked away, but she went about the process of finding that coin and restoring it to its proper place. But you know, the silver, my friend, in Bible's days, just like today, silver was very uh, invaluable, invaluable. That means there was no price uh, that it was not worth because it was just worth all kinds of things. And it de declared her status that I belong to a man. I belong to my husband. It declared her independence. It declared that she, she was one that really believed in the customs of that day. Her search was intense. She had already searched high and low. Uh, she was thinking that that coin had been lost in the dirt. It had been lost in the dwelling, meaning the house. She thought that particular coin was lost, my friend, uh, among all the various things and, and even among the darkness, if you will. But her success was immeasurable because she retrieved it and she restored it. And guess what she did? She rejoiced. You see, God is never surprised. Never surprised when you come to your senses and you allow Him to become the Lord of your life. I developed principles years ago when I came to Christ that I still have the same convictions. There's some places I'll go with you and some places I wouldn't. If you were to say, let's go visit so-and-so that's sick, I'd love to go there. Or you might say, hey, we've had a man in the church that's been coming, and he's not really sure if he's a Christian, I want to go there. But if it's things that challenge my integrity or my conviction, and I know that I will stand before the Lord on those things, I don't want to go there. So this morning, I want you to understand that the lost coin was really just kind of an illustration that among the meager, God wants to seek and He wants to save. The lost sheep was, it's not about one in a hundred. It's not about one in ten. And you'll find when we talk about the lost son, it's not about one out of two. But it's all about one at a time. And boy, you're talking about the portals of glory resounding in such praise band activity. Man. 
It's the same thing. You know, in Bible days, why do we clap when people get baptized? You know, in Bible days, there was persecution that went on uh, about believers. They paid a price for it. But remember, in Bible days, when they would go and they would be baptized, there would be applause because they would take a stand at the place where that they wanted people to know, I'm a Christian now. I don't have to... I don't have to struggle with Judaism. I don't have to struggle with ritual. I don't have to struggle with sacrifice. It's all been done by the person of the Lord Jesus. And I believe this with all my heart, my friend. I believe that we, we find that the, the Son in this case, and I, and I want to read these verses, if you will, if you don't care. You seem like, uh, and I'll let you out by 1 o'clock, okay? But the Bible says in verse 11, uh, church, it says, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me. Now there you go. That's the kind of son we want. Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And incidentally, his estate consisted of three parts. He gave the younger son one-third. And you'll find that he'll say to the older son, he'll say, all that I have is yours. He is going to give that oldest son, which was a custom, he's going to give them the majority of the estate, in this case being two-thirds. So he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after, the youngest son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. If you're taking notes, the word prodigal just means uh, to live a reckless life or, or to live a wasteful life. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods. And now a pod was, was basically kind of like a, a dried portion of, of the carob tree, which was a very uh, widespread popular tree in that day, the carob tree. But you would find that as the pigs or the swine would, would eat those things, you find now he has come to, to the end of his own thinking because he starved to death and he's eating these carob, dried up carob pods, if you will. And the Bible says that the swine ate, no one gave him anything, but when he came to himself. Isn't that what we hope for everybody in life? That they'll come to themselves. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me, he gone from give me, now he says, make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, Take the sandals off his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they began to be merry. My friend, I find not only is there joy in finding, but there's joy in forgiving. Because the Father's love always prevails at the point of your life when you think that there's no hope for you. And when you experience the springs of forgiveness, you'll find just as this prodigal that he not only repented, but he returned and he was reclaimed. But I love the fact that there was joy of feasting. How many of you love the feast? Anybody? Some of you show it well, I won't tell you, but I mean, I, I love the feast. I really love the feast. I had to take off the shirt that I was going to wear this morning because I told my, my wife, I said, it's coming out of my pants. I can't, I can't wear that shirt. So I put on a shirt that kind of made me look a little bit thinner than it did. And as soon as I let the air out, that stomach will come out here to somewhere. And Kevin, you'll have, to, you'll have this, another uh, coat just like the one you have, amen. But you know what the expressions of the Father is there was an embrace, 
an embrace that only a father knows when he hugs his son. Isn't that amazing thing when you come to Jesus? It seems like that when nobody else knows what you're about, it's just like he embraces us spiritually. I remember when I lost my mom a few years back, and I found a little place down in my basement that I just fell apart, and here I am in a fetal position. I'm weeping. She's with Jesus. And I, I called upon God that day, and I said, Lord, I need to feel your embrace today because I can't get up. We're going to have to do my mama's funeral. And I promise you it felt like all his presence was just raising me up from there. And he embraced me. And he loved me. That's the same with that father that day. That's the same that every father in this room ought to hug his children. Because you see, that embrace gives a child assurance and blessing. The Bible says there was a kiss, meaning the pledge of peace and reconciliation. The Bible says there was a robe. His rags are being removed because now he's in a place of, of position. Now he is considered a child of the Father, the same way it is when you come to Jesus. And he pronounced the robe in the original language of Scripture. It's called stole, which typically would probably have the same application as the garment that we call a stole. The Father wanted His Son to have the best as a sign of joy that you're home. And then there was a ring. Verse 22. The ring that, gave, that they gave to the prodigal had so much meaning, but it gave assurance and union with that son. That you're home. You don't need to dwell on where you've been, but you're home today. I wish you'd write this down today because it meant so much to me. I wrote this down in my Bible, and I very simply wrote this quote. The prodigal learned the hard way, now listen to me, that you cannot enjoy the things that money can buy if you ignore the things that money cannot buy. And my friend, if you are filling your family with things that have to be money, buying for favor, or or these other things, you're on the wrong track. Let me give you a little acrostic as I prepare to close. The acrostic would be the word Father. Now, acrostic means that you go down and every initial stands for something. The F in Father means faith. It stands for faith. And I'm talking about an active faith, a faith that's demonstrated in my leadership, a, a, a faith that's demonstrated in your godly decisions and your godly behavior and, and, and des desiring the best for your child. A, in Father, faith is F. A is acceptance. I accept my child the way that God has given me my child. And I will love my child. I will train my child in the way he should go or she should go. And when he's old, he shall not depart from those things. T is time. My son still remembers. I thought it was probably something he would think the list, probably the most boring thing he'd ever done. He still remembers a little fishing trip that I took him when I was in seminary. And we caught all these crappie from a dock. And that little booger back then, he was about five maybe, he whipped me. I can't remember if he whipped me or I let him whip me. But since he's here today, I'm going to say he whipped me, okay? But here's the deal. He still remembers, not the fish, he remembers the time. Because there's so much about our lives. We are so busy today. Time is the essential of any relationship in life. You want to walk with God, it takes time to spend with Him. You want a child that loves you, it takes time. So you got faith, you got acceptance, you got time. H is help. 
H of Father means help. You're always there to help a child when they're struggling. E is the word ear, meaning I have an ear to listen to you because E also means to encourage you. And then R is the word responsible. I want to see you do what's right and what's needed. And you know, there was one more lost thing that day, and I won't share that today because Pastor Bill might be talking on this same subject next week, and he'll do it more justice, but I call it the lost sibling. You see, the hard heart of the father that stayed home, the hard heart of the oldest brother that was going to get two-thirds of the estate, was probably more unspiritual than the pig pen experience of his younger brother. He was filled with self-righteousness. He was doing things for his own glory rather than just loving his father. And his father had to make a plea to him to come into the uh, time of feasting. The father had to make a plea to him that there's a choice. Come on in and, and rejoice with us because you're, your brother's home. And we find that the father in verse number 31, 32, that he pleaded with him. He, he promised him. Uh, he praised him for his, his efforts. He reminded them that everything was already his. You know what Christianity is about? The same thing that it was in raising child, children rather. A child really strives to please a parent. But there's a place where that child makes a choice if it means that that child is going to be deprived of using a gift that God has given that child. I have no regrets raising my children. I raised them in church. They tell all their friends that they had drug problems in the church, that their daddy drug them to church every Sunday. Amen. I have no regrets. And I'm sure that it caused some strain. But I would never go back and change anything that I did. Because now the whammy's on them to raise their children the way that God intends for them to do. So this morning I want to tell you this, is that God is so pleased when you stop and realize that He is seeking you because you're lost. He's pleading with you to be found, and He will rejoice with you when you come to Christ for salvation. And you have a choice today. Your choice is either heaven, meaning I was found. Mother's Day 1975, old LB, Larry Bradley, he crossed that portal, man. No longer was he hell bound, but he came to Christ because he made a decision that Jesus was already there and he's seeking him. He opened his eyes and recognized Jesus was opening his arms to me and invited me to invite him into my life. How many remember that day? I bet you could tell some great stories. My story isn't so great. But you have a choice. You can leave here today found on the left, or if you leave here today lost, there's no hope for you, and to gamble on some other thing, thinking that you have time to do it, I don't think so. And God calls on you today. Why? Because He is a specialist in seeking and saving, restoring, and rejoicing. Let's stand with our heads bowed, if you would. You know what I was thinking coming to church this morning? I was thinking how many people are like me. Sometimes we forget. We lose track of what it was like to be lost. We lose track of of our life when we were running. Friend, we, we lose track of, uh, of 
We lose track of what it felt like when the Father's love reached out to us. I'll never forget those things, but you know what? I'm not sure that I won't stand before God one day and have to answer why I didn't share as much about my story with lost people. See, when it comes down to the end of this age, <laughs> it's still about two things, the lost or the found. The backbone of world missions today is reaching the lost where they'll be found before it's too late. And as a pianist begins to play, I just want to say to you, some of us know people in our lives, friends, associates, co-workers. When's the last time you prayed for their soul? When's the last time you prayed for their marriage? When's the last time you really just prayed that God would just use your life uh, in a setting like school or in a setting like the lab or in a setting like the hospitals or, or, or whatever it may be? I bet you that if you told me your story today, I bet you you already have one name that you know you should pray for. And I wonder this morning, because I know Bill would do the same thing. We can't dismiss and go to the beach unless you're ready to drive. <laughs> but I wonder if you'd be willing just to come and Call that name out right here in this church. Lord, I want to see this lost friend of mine or my son or my daughter or my wife, my husband. I want to see them found. And I know you're seeking them, Lord. But maybe you can use me to give them the same message that you gave me. If you feel like you could pray, why don't you come? Just, just come and pray. I'm not going to say a word to you. You just come. You ought to, you ought to just come because every one of us knows somebody that you really are burdened for. And would you come this morning just before we start singing? And I'm assuming then with no response, I'm assuming then that either I didn't, <clears throat> didn't clarify some things or possibly all your friends are saved. Yeah, come on, come on, most of you, come on. Come on. And then what about you that, as we have our heads bowed and our eyes closed, what about your choice? Are you on the left side of the screen knowing you're heaven bound? Or are you on the right side having no idea? Well, friend, at the close of the service, I'll be here like Pastor Bill would, and I'd like to show you. I'll have some co-workers that know their Bibles. But you ought to come. The Father is waiting on you to come over that hill. You've been out there in the far country uh, experience and now he just wants to embrace you and he wants to give you that assurance he wants to give you that ring he wants to give you those new shoes my friend why don't you come would you do that I'm going to pray for you right now okay our father I'm not sure today I, I know the power of the gospel we were able to talk a little bit about it I'm not sure today if I I'm not really sure of anything except your presence has been here today and I'm sure of the fact that I was like a lost sheep. I was like a lost coin. I was definitely a lost son. But I'm so glad that as the woman that found her coin and the shepherd that found that sheep and they found that their lives were complete, I'm so grateful today that I'm completed because I have found you as my great shepherd. 
And if anybody in this place is really deferring a decision for some other time, may you follow them throughout their week. May you put undue uh, pressure upon them to get priorities where they need to be. This is your time. Speak to each heart, I pray in Jesus' name. Listen to the words of our musicians today. If God is speaking to you, we're here to give you whatever direction you need to do. Would you come? All right, go ahead. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of Fellowship Hall will be on session number nine, and then we will take a break for Father's Day, but we're going to get the train in order, okay? we got four more weeks after this. God bless each of you. We love each one of you. Uh, Brother Scott, I love this guy. You know what? This guy, I told him this week, we're going to have some big shoes to fill for this guy when he retires. You know what I'm saying? Uh, one good thing about him retiring, well, somebody will get to clean up his office, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> he just smacked me really good. <laughs> I just loving you. <laughs> hey, I appreciate that message. Just give it Larry a hand, man. They were just outstanding. You know, as I was thinking, in my life, uh, the joy he was talking about, I've experienced it. Well, a whole bunch of times when you add it up, but three really main times. The birth of my two kids. When you have a birth and you, moms and dads know this, man, what joy you feel. And the other one was when I got saved. Joy. It's the same feeling. And you know what's really cool, and I appreciate the message. When we as God's children, we go out and we lead people to the Lord. Guess what you feel? You feel joy that when they get saved. So, man, I really appreciate that message. A couple quick announcements. First of all, if you're willing to help in the nursery, our rotation, you're on like once a month uh, uh, with the kiddos, make sure you see Cheryl Newberry about that because we need some more folks to do that. And uh, Kim Jaggers. Kim, come on up. She's got an, uh, a quick announcement about a ladies' event. Yeah, 
thank you. If you're here today and you are a woman, we just want to invite you out Friday night. Um, you know, Alan was talking about how Jim's Jam, they all got together and they played, and we've heard about that a whole bunch, about how fun that was. Well, there's some of us here who can't play an instrument, like me, but I can play a game, and I can eat, and I can talk, and we can hang out. So we're going to do that Friday night. And we just want to invite you to come. It's a great way to get to know people and talk to other women. And, you know, life can sometimes be hard, and we just need to laugh, and we need to get together. So Friday night, 6 to 8, just bring something sweet or something salty. It's going to be in the storm shelter. Come join us. If you um, don't want to drive, if you have problems driving, if you're older or just have problems driving, and you want to ride, talk to Stacy or talk to one of the other uh, women's ministry people, we would love to help get you there. So join us Friday night, 6 to 8, okay? Thanks. Awesome. And the storm shelter isn't really a storm shelter. Uh, it's in behind the church, so you can park back there, park along the side, and make your way to there. And ladies, uh, there's a pool table in there. Leave your quarters at home. No gambling. Okay, but I know they're going to have a great time this Friday, 6 to 8. Okay. Hey, I think that's pick. it. They could pick. It's all right. I mean, you know, I, I believe it like this. Everybody's got a song in them. Some just tear it up getting it out. Amen. <laughs> hey, let's close with what we started with. Give me a, give me a chord, brothers. Thank you for singing. You, you are God. You are Lord. You are all I'm living for. You are King of everything. I want my life. Let's sing it again now. Come on now. You, you are God. And you are Lord. You are all I'm living for. You are King of everything. I want my life to praise you. Oh, y'all have a good Sunday and a good week. We'll see you Wednesday night. God bless.